Hi, welcome to Bible study at Christ Community. We pray that through our study of his word, God would draw all of us closer to himself, revealing more of who he is and continuing to shape us into the people that he created us to be, strengthening and unifying his bride, the church. Thank you for joining us as we seek his instruction together. Hello and welcome back to our study, The Word of Life. We are in week three of looking at 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. Last week we talked about the false teachers that were spreading a false gospel and John's insistence that the church not offer any opportunity for them to do so in their community. We also talked about the fact that Christians were and still are supposed to work together for the sake of the true gospel, even if we can't agree on every minor point of theology and even if we have significant and important disagreements. As long as we agree on the gospel, we have a shared mission to seek first the kingdom of God. Today, we're finally getting into 1 John, and as I said at the end of last week, this book is a bit of an odd duck. It's virtually impossible to create an outline for, so... Instead of going verse by verse, I thought we'd do something a little different and take a week to look at each of the major themes. As we said in week one, in 1 John, John is not just addressing a specific church. More likely, this was an address intended to be circulated around to all of the churches that John had a connection to. And in it, he stresses the importance of a commitment to truth and love in light of the threat that the church, church faces from false teaching. If we look at some of the particular statements that John makes, we can kind of begin to build a picture of this threat. Based on his statements, we can pinpoint four specific errors in the doctrine of these false teachers. First, they apparently claimed to be without sin. Chapter 1, verses 8 to 10 say, If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. Now, obviously, this is a problem because if a person has not sinned, what need do they have for repentance? And as John points out, without repentance, we cannot be forgiven and purified from unrighteousness by God. This is a serious error because it prevents people from experiencing the forgiveness that God wants to offer to them. Now, the second thing that these false teachers were apparently preaching was they denied that Jesus was the Christ. Chapter 2, verses 18 to 23 read like this. Dear children, this is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. This is how we know it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But their going showed that none of them belonged to us. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and all of you know the truth. I do not write to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it, and because no lie comes from the truth. Who is the liar? It is whoever denies that Jesus is the Christ. Such a person is the Antichrist, denying the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever acknowledges the Son has the Father also. And closely related to that, they denied the fact of the Incarnation, that Christ had come in the flesh. Chapter 4, verse 2 says, This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world. The reality of the word made flesh was also probably what John is referring to in chapter 5 when he says, This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. He did not come by water only, but by water and blood. These are huge problems because, as we said when we were discussing the false teachers, if the word has not become flesh, if he is not God incarnate, then our sin has not been atoned for, and we are still dead in our sins. Lastly, they seem to have denied that their faith needed to have any practical outworking in their lives, and we can see this all over the place in 1 John. Chapter 1, verse 6 says, If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. 
Chapter 2, verses 4 to 6 says, Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar, and the truth is not in that person. Chapter 3, verses 7 to 8 say, Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. The one who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who does what is sinful is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The fact that John keeps coming back to this idea over and over again makes it very clear that someone was trying to teach these believers that faith did not need to interfere with their everyday lives, that they could love God but still live however they wanted to. And these probably weren't the only things that they got wrong. They're simply what we can confidently gather from reading John's responses to them. These people claimed spiritual authority. Their argument was probably something along the lines of, we have the Holy Spirit. He has revealed these things to us. So how are these believers to judge? Well, John gives them a solution. He makes it clear that there are two spirits at work in the world, the spirit of God and the spirit of the Antichrist. We just read that in chapter four. But if we back up a little bit to right before that, John tells the believers that they're to test the spirits to find out which kind they are. And he gives them the specific example of which spirit is the Antichrist, the one that says that Jesus Christ has not come in the flesh. Now, this is the example he gives because this was a major heresy that was happening. But obviously, this isn't the only wrong doctrine that could be taught. And John wants the believers to continue to be discerning. If they didn't need to test other things, they wouldn't need the instruction to test the spirits. So how can they identify other wrong doctrine that might come later? Earlier on, John gave them the answer to this. In chapter 2, verses 24 to 27, he says this, As for you, see that what you have heard from the beginning remains in you. If it does, you will also remain in the Son and in the Father. And this is what he promised us, eternal life. I am writing these things to you about those who are trying to lead you astray. As for you, the anointing you receive from him remains in you, and you do not need anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about all things, and as that anointing is real, not counterfeit, just as it has taught you, remain in him. So first he tells them to hang on to what they have heard from the beginning. So what had they heard from the beginning? Well, again, John answers that for us too in the very first few verses of the book. He says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared. We have seen it and testify to it. And we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. What they have heard from the beginning is the witness of the apostles, the testimony of those who were with Christ himself. This was not a subjective experience of the Spirit, like the ones that those teaching false doctrines are claiming. This was truth rooted in face-to-face experience with the word of life himself. John, as we said, was there at Jesus' side during his ministry, during his trial and his death. He saw every moment of it personally. And John saw Jesus face to face and ate with him after his resurrection. This truth that the apostles declared was rooted in eyewitness fact. They saw it, they touched it, they heard it for themselves. And now John assures these believers that the Holy Spirit is in them, also testifying to the truth. They don't need anyone to teach them. Now, obviously, he's not saying that they literally don't need anyone to teach them anything. That would be somewhat weird and counterproductive since he's in the middle of writing something that's meant to teach them things. But what he's saying is that they don't need anyone to give them new revelation. The gospel has, as Jude says, been given once for all to God's holy people. And when Jesus promised the Holy Spirit, what did he say that the Spirit would do? In the Gospel of John, chapter 14, Jesus says, But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. 
He doesn't say that the Spirit is going to fix what he said or correct anything or provide brand new revelation. He says that the Spirit will teach them and remind them of what Jesus taught. John's solution to the problem of false teachers is for the believers to remain in what they have heard from the beginning, to listen to the Spirit who reminds them of what Jesus taught that was passed on to them through John and the other apostles, and to test whatever else they hear against that. He promises that if they remain in what they have been given, they will not be led astray, and they will remain in the Son and in the Father. All right, so we've seen the threats to the truth that John's churches were facing and his solution for them, but what about us? Are we facing similar threats? So I think if we look around us, it's fairly obvious that we are in fact surrounded by lies. Lies about God, lies about creation, lies about who we were made to be. And even if those who are spreading those lies don't think that they're making any commentary at all on Christian doctrine or God, the things that they say are in fact a direct assault on God's created order and on what he has said about who we are and who he is. And I think that's fairly easy for us to see. The world has begun to lose its collective mind. But if we're tempted to think that this threat is only coming from the secular world, and if we want to think we're safe from that kind of situation within the church, all we need to do is open our eyes and visit some local churches and universities and we'll begin to understand that John is not exaggerating when he says that many antichrists have gone out into the world. I promise you it is in our community amongst so-called believers. And I feel like the enemy is leveling up his game because I've run into more of this in the last 10 months than I have in the last 10 years. In fact, my daughter just started her first semester of classes at university where her professor, who claims to be a Christian, is teaching his students every semester that, in fact, the eternal word did not become flesh, that Jesus was only human. This is the exact heresy that John's people were facing. Like the false teachers in John's day, he also rejects the authority of the apostles, and he decides for himself what he will believe from different parts of scripture. And he teaches all of this as a Christian teacher. And this isn't the only heresy being taught on a popular level. If you're interested in seeing the beginning of a list of what's out there, a guy named Dr. Michael Kruger wrote a very short book. It's like less than 100 pages, and it's called The Ten Commandments of Progressive Christianity. And if you read it, you'll quickly see that every single one of the heresies threatening John's churches Every one of them is still very much alive and well and gaining momentum today in the church, along with a bunch of others. And it's not just in our universities. I recently visited a church in the area that's teaching some of the exact same things. That Jesus was just a human, that all religions worship the same God. In fact, I went and looked online to try and find some more examples of this, and I found kind of a strange thing. So I googled inclusive churches in Tacoma just to see how many churches I could find that had statements of beliefs that included things like all religions are valid, etc. And I assumed that because I know for a fact that there are a ton of them, that would be easy. But what I actually found was even more telling, because most of these churches don't even have statements of belief. Now, some of them will refer you back to their denominational statements of belief, but it's clear from other things on their website that they don't actually believe those things. In fact, John Calvin would roll over in his grave if he saw what some of the Presbyterian churches in Tacoma are teaching. But many of them have no statements of belief at all. In fact, I found several that sort of brag about that fact, that their church is so great because they don't expect to agree on their beliefs. They're just there to support each other and explore life together. They take great pride in the fact that they don't actually believe anything. Now, I suspect that if we were to show up there and begin to talk about our beliefs, we'd find out pretty quickly that they do, in fact, believe some things that are non-negotiable, but that's a different story. And it wasn't just one church. It was church after church after church right here in our community that seem to have absolutely no interest in preaching the true gospel of Jesus Christ. 
A large portion of the church is headed for disaster. They're in great danger of being deceived by those who teach these things. So what do we do? Well, thankfully, the same thing that John's churches were to do. They were to hold on to what they had from the beginning, the teachings of Jesus through the testimony of the apostles. Now, the people that John wrote to were there. They knew John's teaching because they had heard it with their own ears. But how do we know what the apostles taught? Well, it's right here. They recorded it for us in scripture. This is the testimony that we're to hold fast to. Now, I realize that that maybe doesn't sound like the most exciting solution. Like I've said all of this, and this is what it comes down to. Read your Bible. I mean, yeah, it is. God has been gracious enough to preserve for us the teachings of the very word of God incarnate in this book. And we are to hold fast to what is in here so that we will not be deceived. Now, I feel like so far, this is all fairly obvious to us, right? I feel like when people come to CCBC in particular and stay here, it's because they value scripture and they have fairly conservative values. And I mostly mean religiously conservative here, not politically, but very commonly those things do overlap a little bit. And I think that's important that we recognize that because I think that's one place that our church might actually be in a little bit of danger. So what we've been talking about so far is on the religiously progressive or liberal end of the spectrum. And I think that most of us here at CCBC realize that that stuff is obviously garbage, right? There may be times when we're tempted to ask, huh, could they be right about that? And I think that's a really good thing. We should be asking ourselves constantly, like, does what we believe line up with scripture? Or is this person who's teaching something else actually right? And we may look at scripture and realize, okay, like a lot of false teaching, there might be a seed of truth there. In fact, Kruger calls those 10 commandments of progressive Christianity a masterclass in half truths. Of course. Everyone knows that a really good lie, a really believable lie, contains as much truth as possible. But most of us who care about what scripture says and want to hold fast to that will look more closely and go, nope, that is just not right. There's a seed of truth there, but like Satan always does, he's twisted it and it's become something very wrong and very ugly. I feel like at our church, we're pretty good at recognizing that on the theologically progressive end of things. But what about the other end? Because I think that as a church, this is where we're more vulnerable to deception. And when I talk about deception here, I'm not necessarily talking about salvation issues. I think most of us at CCBC understand the gospel well enough that we're not going to be tempted to reject the atoning death of Christ and our allegiance to him as Lord as the only means of salvation. But I am talking about very important issues that have the potential for very serious consequences. I think that there are two specific ways that we in particular are somewhat vulnerable. First, on the political front. Now, I know we're not supposed to talk about politics. And for the most part, I don't. And I'm not going to tell you to vote for or whatever. But I do think that there is a thing here that we need to talk about. Because I think that a lot of people on the religiously conservative side of things are also fairly politically conservative. And I think that a lot of them have become overly enamored with certain conservative political commentators. Because we see the falsehood of churches who push things like the LGBTQ agenda, the abortion agenda, and so we start to look around for other people who agree with us, right? And when we look around, there sit the Daily Wire, Fox News, Donald Trump, Prager U, and they agree with us. Of course, we shouldn't be chopping off our children's body parts. That's absurd. Of course, we shouldn't be murdering babies in the womb. That's horrific. And so we listen to them. Because they're saying good things that we agree with. And we listen to them some more. And we listen to their friends. And before you know it, we're uncritically agreeing with everything that they say because they are the good guys, right? They're the good guys fighting for freedom. They're fighting to protect our children. And so we feel like we can relax. 
We feel like we don't need to have our radar up. And before you know it, we're so relaxed that we're lacking any sort of discernment and just assuming that anything that they say has to be right because they're the good guys. But the truth is, they're not always right because they're not the good guys. Nobody's the good guy except Jesus. And so they get things wrong a lot. I mean, the most obvious example would be that both, for example, Ben Shapiro and Dennis Prager would deny that Jesus is the Christ. They would deny that he is the eternal word made flesh. Now, I don't think that anyone's believing they're right about that, but that's just the most obvious example of where they're wrong. And if they're wrong on that, what else are they wrong on? Probably a lot. And then we could move on to Donald Trump, who is kind of a terrible human being. Now, so am I, so are you. We're all kind of terrible human beings. That's the point, right? But the kicker is that he also seems to be completely unrepentant. And there was and is still a large portion of the evangelical church, theologically conservative people who act as though he's some kind of knight in shining armor or the next Elijah. And that is complete and utter nonsense. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying you shouldn't listen to a PragerU podcast. By all means, listen, they have some good things to say. And I'm not saying you're not allowed to vote for Donald Trump. Because sometimes you're presented with two horrible choices. And the only option is to choose which is on balance less awful. Right? This is like if someone walks into an elementary school with a machine gun and starts killing children. If you're armed, you probably won't hesitate for a second to pull the trigger and shoot them dead. Do we want to kill people? No. Are we going to suffer for it? Yeah, the person who pulls the trigger will probably be messed up for a really long time because of it. It's awful, but it's a necessary awful thing. And I don't know, maybe voting for Donald Trump is the political equivalent of shooting a guy who's actively trying to harm our children. That's possible. But my point is that we have an obligation to understand that just because someone agrees with us on some serious, critically important issues does not mean that they are right about everything. It doesn't mean that we can't be deceived by them. Because we are to sift everything, no matter who says it, through what we were given in the beginning. To put it all out in the light of scripture and see how it looks. And I'm afraid that we don't always do that with people that we consider to be the good guys. Speaking of which, this is not just a problem in the secular political realm. I think we sometimes do the same thing with teachers and the church. There are some very popular, mostly theologically sound preachers that I know people in our church listen to online. I'm talking about guys like John MacArthur, David Jeremiah, Vadi Bakum. And listen, these guys are not false teachers, okay? If somebody wanted to know how to be saved, I would have no hesitation in pointing them straight at these teachers because I think that they understand the gospel well and they're sincere brothers in Christ. But they're not right about everything. And my concern is the way that I hear people talk about some of these guys as though they are infallible sources of biblical truth. Their first instinct, if they have a question, is to look up what one of these teachers has to say about it and to just believe whatever they say, no questions asked. Sometimes it doesn't seem to occur to people that, hey, maybe these guys might not be completely right on every single issue. And that is concerning because there's only one source of infallible biblical truth, and that is scripture itself. And we have an obligation both as individuals and as a community, to keep coming back again and again to Scripture and asking, what does it say about this topic? Now, that's not to say that we can't ask what a certain teacher says about it. In fact, that's a good idea. Scripture is clear that God gave us teachers for the benefit of the body of Christ. We should listen to those that God has gifted with teaching. But we should also be aware that they are human beings with flaws. No, I'm not advocating a critical spirit. We do wrong if we sit in church or listen to a sermon by a godly preacher and we're just looking for flaws. 
right? And I'm saying that to myself because my mind naturally always gravitates toward what could be better here and not just in church or when listening to preaching, but in every aspect of my life. Like, you know, I'll wash my car and my eye will immediately zoom to the one tiny speck of dirt that I missed. Um, that's just how my brain works. So I have to warn myself against this constantly. I have to remind myself that God speaks when his word is preached. And if I'm listening to someone that I know is usually theologically sound, who is a godly preacher, then the most important thing I need to ask myself is what does the Lord want me to learn from what I'm hearing? There's a line that we need to learn to walk between discernment and cynicism or self-righteousness, right? Between listening to the Holy Spirit and having a critical spirit. And may God help us to know the difference. And I think that that's one reason that God gives us the wider church body. Because when we're talking about hard to understand or difficult issues, we can check ourselves by asking what our favorite Bible teacher thinks. Even better, we can ask what multiple teachers think. Teachers that we know hold to scripture. I never sit down to write a Bible study without using multiple commentaries and watching videos by multiple teachers that I know hold to scriptural inerrancy and authority. We have a huge advantage in the day that we live in. Because of the internet, we have access to godly teachers from all over the world and from all throughout time, in fact. God uses the community of believers to keep each other in check and to hold each other accountable to scripture. And thanks to modern technology, that community is bigger than ever, and I hope that we never take that for granted. John records Jesus telling us that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And John reminds us that whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. Right doctrine, right belief can be a matter of life and death. And even when it's not, it's a matter of the greatest commandments, of loving God with all your mind and loving your neighbor as yourself. This is critically important. And we're surrounded by opportunities for deception everywhere we turn, outside the church and even within it. But we don't need to be afraid because John reminds us that we have been given the spirit of truth. We don't need to fear, but we do need to understand the situation. The time is now. We cannot afford to be lazy or complacent. And I'm just going to be frank, ladies. We cannot afford to act like helpless little girls. I'm not going to say all that I could say on this topic, but I feel like the popular Christian culture over the last few decades has not done us any favors. Our main contribution to the kingdom of God is not to sit on the sidelines and look pretty. Show me that in scripture. Show me where it says that. I feel like as we've rejected the idea that men and women are the same because it's not biblical, some of the church has gone too far the other direction. They become downright chauvinist, seeing women as passive observers in the spiritual battle that's taking place all around us. And that is a mistake because it's unbiblical. Search the scripture. I don't see any gender contingencies in Ephesians chapter 6. In Ephesians 5, I see that the husband is the head of the wife and that submission is a real and necessary thing for us as wives. But in Ephesians 6, all I see is every single believer, male or female, called to be alert, to wake up every single day and to clothe themselves with the armor of God, because our enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. He is coming for you, for your best friend, for your children. He is coming for the church, and we are called to fight the good fight. It's true that despite what society tells us, men and women are not the same, and our battles may look very different. But make no mistake, we are called men and women to pick up the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and to make certain that we understand exactly how to wield it. The good news is that the very same Jesus has given us the same Holy Spirit with the same power to correct us, to teach us, and to remind us of the very same gospel that has the power to save us today, just like it did 2,000 years ago. John's people are not the only ones who received the Holy Spirit when they believed. We do not need to be afraid. John's church was in serious circumstances. There was danger all around them, 
and we find ourselves in a similar place. But Jesus himself said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The victory of truth is secure. Our responsibility is simply to make sure that we know what God has said so that we will be able to sort truth from lies and be faithful in the battle. And that is why we're here. So next week, we're going to talk about where truth properly applied will always lead us. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for graciously preserving the truth of what Jesus and the apostles taught so that we can still have it today. And we thank you for your Holy Spirit who promises to teach us all things. We pray that you would give us ears to hear your spirit as he speaks, that we would be attentive and listen to that voice, and that we would constantly be comparing what we hear to what you've given us through your word so that we are not led astray by our own hearts, by our own desires, but that we are constantly growing closer to your heart and seeking to do your will. In Jesus' name, amen.